when I'm talking about class, I'm also talking about, in general, about technologies that essentially require programming or web development in order to embed them online. So HTML5, Flash, etc. And in any case, when, when Flash came out, people were actually able to put data on the web, it was really an enormous leap forward in a lot of ways. It allowed organizations that had the resources and the talent, like the New York Times, to put amazing interactive visualizations on the web. Now, let me get into a couple of examples that I think are really indicative of why we need better access to data. Now, these, this first one I'm going to show you is a flash visualization. I'm sure, um, how many people have seen this? Yeah, I Okay, good, yeah. So, I'll, I'll, I'll be relatively brief since a lot of people have seen it, but this is one of the most amazing visualizations that I, that I've ever seen. And it doesn't seem like it at first, and that's the thing with data. Sometimes you need to kind of play with it a little bit. You can't just look at a static chart and say, oh, that's awesome. Sometimes you want to interact, you want to know more, you want to dig in. And this single chart has easily 10,000 stories that can be told just from this one single chart. But the main story is about the development and of really the modern world, it's about the industrial revolution, about the technology revolution, and how we've moved on from extremely low income per percent in the early 1800s and extremely low life expectancy to really across the world with, I guess, the exception of sub Saharan Africa, a much more developed world. So you can play this visualization, you can see the different countries, each of these dots is a country, and the size of the circle represents the population of that country. So you can see countries become, as they're moving to the right, becoming more, or excuse me, developing in a, a broader and a more successful economy, higher GDP. Now, I want you to watch, you know, in the, if you see that big jump downwards, that was the first world war, you see the second world war coming up in a second, see everything moves backwards, it's a very violent shift um, as, as countries go through the war and get expectancy jobs. And then, of course, the modern era, here we are, Today. Now, as a whole, this is an interesting story. It's interesting to see the entire world and how, they, how these different countries interact with each other and how they've moved from, from this lower this lower quadrant to the top right quadrant. But also, it's interesting just to look at individual countries. So, for instance, if I, if I take China as an example in play, um, it's one of the most fascinating things. Of course, everybody knows that um, just kind of the basic economic strokes of China, but if you see, if you watch just the, the drastic movements of, of, the, of the country, it's amazing. And the growth from really one of the poorest countries in the world to really one of the most dynamic economies in the world is pretty rapid, starting around the 1970s. And before that, you see, um, you see the Great Leap Forward right there, which is really the Great Leap Backward. And then you see the development happen um, really from the so it's amazing to think that a country can move from essentially a agrarian, completely industrial society to a really first world economy in such a small amount of time. Now, visualizations don't always have to be so serious, and they don't always necessarily need to inform you about a topic. Sometimes they can just engage you about something that you already know. This is one of the, my favorite visualizations as well. I guess it's all ours, so I probably shouldn't say that, but I, I like to say it because Every time I see it, I, I get excited about it. Not just because it's built beautifully, but also because it shows something that we all understand, which is simply that Walmart has grown exponentially from just this small, single store in Bentonville, Arkansas. And you think, oh yeah, well, Walmart, Walmart's just always been around. It's always been pervasive. It's always just been a, a part of our society, and it continues to grow. But the truth is, for a very long time, I mean, really until the mid-70s and early 80s, it was really just a, a southern and western uh, phenomenon, a black phenomenon, a store. And so it's easy to think that it's just always been everywhere, but the truth is that it hasn't. I mean, it's, this visualization is one of those ones that you can just watch, and it's, it's fascinating to see the way that, it grew, that Walmart grew. You can see the green, uh, green dots now, and those are Sam's Clubs as opposed to Walmart, because they're popping out. Now, something that's very interesting here is that there's only 1,200 stores in 1989, with 1,500 in 1990. By the end of the 2010s, there's going to be more than, like, more than 4,000 stores. Just amazing. 1,000 in 1990, 4,000 in 20 more years. 
just amazing to think about, especially in, context, in the context of all of the local discussions that go on about Walmart and about is it okay to let Walmart into this, into this town? Is it okay to, to let it into our city? Um, I, I live in a small town in Washington and we, our city council decided not to let Walmart in and then six months later we decided to let Target in. So it's like, I think there's this huge difference. Not, but in any case, I, I think that so this isn't something that you need to know. It's not something that is necessarily informing you of something that you didn't already know. But it's showing you information you already know in a way that is so engaging and interactive that you, you kind of want to share it. You kind of want to tell other people about it. And you want to play with it uh, in a way that just somebody's saying, oh yeah, there's 4,000 more ones. OK? So this interaction with data and this engagement with it is a fascinating use and then, of course, like I was saying before, it doesn't always have to be serious. Um, sometimes it can be about something that's uh, a little bit more lighthearted or, or maybe less uh, socially important. And this is a visualization that essentially shows for each of these different events in the Olympics, the time between the first, second, third, fourth, and fourth place of people in each of these events. Now, when you look at the when you look at the x-axis of this visualization, so along it, you can see, okay, well, this person is only a quarter of a second behind the, the winner in their fourth place. Okay, that's great. And you kind of, you can perceive it, and the visualization is helpful, but at the same time, you, it's hard to perceive in your mind exactly how close that is. So you can actually play this, and you can hear the difference between first, second, So that was the difference between first and 22nd place in men's down less than a second and a half. And this is in the, the for the 2010 Olympics. It's amazing to think about. And again, this is something that you know, you understand, yes, these races are very close, but you don't really recognize how close it is. I mean, the difference between 22nd and maybe even fourth place is really just maybe tugging a little bit tighter, turning the corner a little bit tighter. It's amazing to think that it's that close. And before I saw this, I never really even thought it was something that I should look into or be interested in. But the person that built this visualization, they took the time to dissect what was important about the visualization and really tell a story with it, which is that the difference is so much smaller than you can even think or even understand by looking at the visualization itself. Now, all of these visualizations that I've shown you have been, um, have been thought of HTML5, and that's fantastic. And if you have the skills and you have the know-how to create visualizations like that, like this with those tools, then you're empowered. I mean, you can really, you can go out and create something as, as amazing as this, as, as engaging as this Walmart is, and as informative as the gap in your But the problem is that, to be truthful, maybe not this group, but in the populace as a whole, that's maybe 99% of the population, 95% of the population that's excluded. It doesn't seem like it, but I mean, that's really the truth. How many people really know how to do, how to program something like this in Flash and make it work exactly how they want to? <laughs> Furthermore, what about the time it takes to create something? Even if you're extremely confident, it takes time. It takes a lot of time to create an interactive visualization and put on the web, which is why people haven't really done it yet. And it's really been, still even with these technologies, it's, and it's been for the enterprise just like the deal was. Because you have to hire somebody to do it, or you have to literally take the time to do it yourself. Now, IBM has taken that problem and, uh, about three or four years ago, and they came out with PennyEyes, which is a tool for taking data and then uploading it to the web and turning it into an interactive visualization. So it's powerful because essentially you're taking all of the, the complex technical steps out of the creation process and giving all of the power to the user through the, the interface of the of what essentially the website. So let me show you a little bit of how it works. Essentially, you upload the data set and then you can create a visualization from any of the, uh, from that data set um, just by uh, clicking on the different pieces that you'd like to visualize. So in, in this case, um, I had one exactly right. Uh, 
So this is unemployment in South Africa. So I'm just going to remember. This is somebody, something that somebody else has uploaded that I don't have access to. I just have to it. So you kind of, it's kind of a point of more for baby visualizations. You can think of it like that. And then you can go to visualize and choose different types of visualizations that you'd like to turn this data into. So in this case, we'll just use a bar chart. And then it's Java, so always get an annoying reminder. Uh, so I can switch between different age groups to see unemployment um, among that group in South Africa. Now, it's pretty simple, I'll admit. And Maybe not something that you'd be interested in doing. Maybe you'd want to go the extra mile and create that flash visualization. But at the same time, it's also powerful because you can take this and embed it in any blog or website. So you can take something that's completely non interactive, which is just a spreadsheet, or maybe even static, um, a static visualization. You can turn it into something that people can interact with and engage with. And you can share it. Let me show you a visualization that somebody's actually made with many eyes to kind of illustrate this. Now, I've been talking about visualizations that are very widely understandable and widely important. Um, there's, there are things that if everybody's interested in them, they at least know about them. But the truth is that not everything is the Olympics. Not every single story is something that everybody is going to care about. But that doesn't mean that those aren't important stories to be telling. This is a visualization that shows basically the tweet stream for an Irish election. And this, this person, they don't necessarily have any technical skills, but they're running this blog, and they want to show people with this word above the, basically the, how often different terms are used. So the, the bigger the word that is mentioned. Simple, global, to the point. And of course, I might be completely honest with you, I don't care at all about this visualization. It's not something that inspires me. But that's okay. It's not my local data. There is local data for me that I would love to visualize like this. I'd love to visualize my logo collections exactly like this. And so, what about those situations where you've got data and you want to share it, and share it, and make it interactive and engage people with it, but you don't necessarily have an enormous audience that you can spread across out of it. So that's that's kind of the area that many of us built. Now, I've explained Flash HTML5 more complex technology. Which is really very simple and also kind of limited. You basically get what it gives you, so to speak. But there is definitely an enormous area in the middle where there's space for a tool that is maybe a little bit more complex than many others, but at the same time is a lot more powerful and more akin to the visualizations that you can create with the flash. And that's the area that, that we've really been going after at Tableau Public and trying to uh, educate people or enable people to create visualizations. And we're really excited about it because we think that, truthfully, a more 90, 90% of the population is somewhat technical, people literate, able to create uh, different things and work with spreadsheets, but they're not quite to the point where they're able to create lots of visualizations. So we're we such a great Tableau Public. You had an idea like that last night, you're probably a little bit interested in this visualization. It simply shows um, for different beers the number of calories per 100 milliliters and the percent of alcohol um, at the same time. So you can see um, the different types of beers that and how they uh, basically their alcohol content where they stand in proportion to other uh, other beers now. Um, you can see some of the some of the ice spheres as you will are the ones that are the higher alcohol content for lower calories. And the funny thing is, you know, this is one of those things that why would you ever visualize this? Why would you ever take the time, right? But since it's simple and straightforward, why not? Why not share? Why not have a big time with it? Why not entertain with the data? Why not inspire people to just think about things like this? It's one of those one of those things that you would never never take the time to do unless you had an easy now, um, the people that people definitely use Tableau Public for more serious things as well. This is a visualization by, by Peter Aldous of the New Scientist, which I think we really use to interact with it. And essentially what it's showing is the, he created this actually a year ago, right after the Fukushima uh, nuclear disaster was phenomenon in Japan. And he was trying to answer a very simple question, which is, 
where are the new bird waterways? How many are around us? Are they near the island? Are they dangerous? Are they the type that um, we're in at Fukushima? These are classic questions that anybody would be curious about asking. And actually, I put my East Asia students so you can see how the different ones in. Here you can see um, the reactor in Fukushima is a, is, a, is a boiling water reactor. So it's a type. And these are the different ways of essentially cooling the reactors you can see them here as types. So you can see that in Japan, that's one of the most common types, the, the boiling water. And although that type is actually inherently safe, it is interesting to think about. In Europe, however, we can look at a type that maybe necessarily isn't quite as safe, which is the, uh, excuse me, I have to actually put my shut down here so I can remember which one it is. So it's the, uh, the light water cooled graphite moderated type, which was um, at Chernobyl. And essentially, because this was graphite moderated, graphite is actually, um, it's, can be, um, or it's, it's, the type of reactor is cooled with, with sodium and graphite, and sodium is actually explosive. So one of the reasons why, or so the reason why Chernobyl um, melted down and exploded was because of the type of cooling. And you can see, I can unselect the shutdown reactors, and you can see only those that are operating. You can see that Russia still operates three reactors of that exact type um, to this day. Now, obviously, they probably changed how they run them, but at the same time, it's interesting that they're still in today. Now, one of the powerful things about Tableau Public and that um, makes it fun to use is that you can take other people's visualizations that they've created and you can kind of use the data to create your own view. So I can actually download Peter's visualization here and use it to use the data itself to visualize. This is going to take a while, but it's a good thing I already downloaded it. So I'm just going to um, open this up in Tableau Public. So this is what the visualization looks like. So Tableau Public is a desktop client essentially that you can use to create visualizations. And this is the view that, that Peter has created and with the different interactive snippets that you can use in the interactive. Now, I think a, a simple question to ask would be, well, where's the nearest nuclear reactor to here? And what, how is it cool? What, what sort of things does it did use? And, um, are there any nuclear plants that are, really, that are being constructed now? So this is essentially what it looks like in Tableau to, to create a visualization. You can simply double click on, on different features and you can drag and drop them to visualize essentially. And as you're dragging and dropping, Tableau automatically creates the visualization that makes the most sense given the different pieces that you've outlined. So you can see I've created essentially a visualization that shows the, the generating capacity uh, for all of these different plants of the world. I'm going to filter down to just the US because of course, for us, that story is the most interesting in the party and all the data for the rest of the world. As I switch from different pieces, there are different places in the visualization I can, I can change it on the fly and, and actually not have to be thinking about, oh, okay, well, now I need to go through this wizard to, to move that out of there and to do that sort of thing. It's all kind of on at the speed of, as you're thinking of it, um, which is a really powerful thing to think about it because you're able to not get engaged in the how I'm creating this, but the what I'm creating with it. So we can see the different types of, of reactors in the US. We've got pressurized water and boiling water, so another type at Chernobyl, but oh, pressurized water is the same as, as Fukushima. You can see we've got uh, a couple of reactors here in Texas as well. So when I've got something like this, of course, the, the next step that anybody would want to do is to share, share a finding and, and allow other people So I can bring this out into a dashboard, add a title, call it the nuclear reactors in the US. And then I can add pieces of interactivity that allow people to work with the visualization and ask questions of it. So I can enable, for instance, a filter that allows people to say, well, I'm only going to see those reactors that were created, or excuse me, were starting to be constructed at a certain time. And this in itself is actually a really interesting story because I always had the perception that we were kind of always adding nuclear plants and it was just one of those things that were being built as normal. But the truth is, if you filter back here to 2000, you can see the visualization hasn't changed at all. Go back to 1990, the 
again hasn't changed at all in 1980. Again, it hasn't changed at all. We'll go back to 1970, and you can see a good, a good deal of the reactors go away. So what this tells us is that a lot of the nuclear reactors in the US, a good portion of them, the ones that you're looking at right here, were, were built before 1970. In other words, they're over 40 years old. And most nuclear reactors at this time were designed and built to last around 40 years. This isn't to say that they aren't safe, because they are safe, for the reason. But it's an interesting thing to think about, that we've got this massive amount of, of power generating capacity in the US that is essentially going to be coming offline or will need to be drastically rebuilt in the near future. And then once I have this view, um, I won't actually show you, but I won't um, actually do I can essentially save it to the web and then I can embed that in any of other websites, just like Peter's done here. And see, I get the share button and essentially I just get a piece of it of uh, JavaScript. So, Taco Pueblo took this idea of, okay, well, many eyes was really simple and easy to use for everybody, which is great, um, because it allows anybody to put data on the web. But at the same time, it's not as powerful as Flash, but Flash, of course, is too complex and difficult for those people to use. So, with Tableau, it's kind of in the middle, and you're able to get exactly the view that you want and change it, change the format, change the fonts, and change how things are arrayed. But at the same time, you don't necessarily have to be, or you don't at all have to be writing calculations in different, uh, different I, you don't have to have any programming skills to do it, that's what I'm saying. So, So where does that leave us today? Um, after we've kind of seen the three, well I guess we call them the major tools that we did on the web today. First of all, visualizations can engage. So you saw that the gap in your visualization and how engaging it was. About data that you would never even think about in your normal circumstance, and yet it's so amazing to see and to click on your country and to see its progress over time and becoming a less developed Visualizations can inform just like the Walmart visualization. They can tell us something in a way, or they can tell us something that we already knew in a way that we never had to do before. And of course, they can entertain, just like the, the beer visualization or the uh, the Olympics. And they can be for anything from the most global subject, like the visualization Peter showed the, uh, the nuclear reactors, to the most local, small, just your school, just or neighborhood or So I'm not going to prevent the course I've been uh, pretty the future, but there are definitely some trends and some things that are going to continue happening in this space and that are going to make visualizations easier for the use. The first of all is, um, first one is, is web-based creation. This is kind of the direction of public public publishing. I think in general people will expect things to be um, able to be They'll expect it to be not just on the web, but also full features. So it's kind of that, that dichotomy of you have tools that you can use on the web, but they're relatively simple, 